Good afternoon. Uh, what a pleasure to be speaking to such a, a rich audience of various disciplines. I'm being called a real agronomist. Well, I'm not sure what that means. I chose this title for a, for a reason, a golden age for agronomy. So I'm going to talk today about three issues. The first is, well, is this a golden age for agronomy? The second one is a, a case of contested agronomy, and I'm going to talk around conservation agriculture, because it's one I've been rather actively involved in. And I'm going to finish with a few thoughts about future challenges and thinking about agronomy, agronomy in context. So, is this a golden age for agronomy? What I remember, in a sense, is the 1990s for me were a bit the dark ages. See, I was a, a professor at Y College, University of London, I was working on issues, you know, particularly around soil fertility in Africa, and it was really, really hard to get anybody's attention. Nobody was interested in our work. Y College has since closed. This was a time when the illustrious Wageningen Agricultural University changed its name. We got rid of agriculture. Nobody wanted to hear about agriculture. If we think about the embassies, the British embassies in, in Africa, everyone had a, an agricultural attaché in the 1980s. There is not a single one left, yeah? The 1990s, the Dark Ages. When did it all turn round? Well, what I remember very much was this, this uh, white paper from Hilary Benn, Agriculture and Poverty, Unlocking the Potential. Up till that time, I'd found it impossible to get anybody interested in Den Haag and the Ministry around Agriculture. After that, things started to change. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation moved from just having focus on health to also having a focus on agriculture around 2005. That led then to them spinning off together with Rockefeller, the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa. We had a World Development Report, Agriculture for Development, all of a sudden, the spotlight was shifting. Then we had this global financial crisis, this massive peak of grain prices in 2008. That led to several countries closing their borders to, to trading grain, and that led to food riots. Those food riots had global <coughs> impacts. Use your loaf, why food prices were crucial in the Arab Spring. They really changed the face of world politics. Food was very much back on the agenda. Publications on food security, you can see here going up uh, exponentially, and particularly after 2008. And I like this one in particular. If we go back to 2004, my department, with 18 different professorial chair groups, was on the verge of extinction. Plant sciences in Wageningen. We had an intake of five undergraduates. Yeah? And since then, things have gone up exponentially. We've got far too many students now. <laughs> so, is this a golden age for agronomy? Well, my answer would be yes. I've never known in my whole career the spotlight to be so focused on the type of work we're doing and to have so much interest from all different angles, from NGO sector, from government sectors, from private sectors, coming to ask for our advice. Isn't that fantastic? Second topic. <laughs> the case of conservation agriculture. So I've been working around this issue of poor soil fertility in Africa now, dare I say it, for 30 years in Africa. I started in 1986 in north of Tanzania with the first project. It's a slide I like to use, it's a slide that I, I, I like to point out, these white anthroposols, these man-made created soils due to overuse and overexhaustion, these white sands, they don't occur in nature, they're perfect human creations. But there, that, that issue of soil fertility means it's very, very hard to get production going. So I've been working all of my career about use of nitrogen-fixing legumes, and that will feed into six talk later. So these different types of green manures, agroforestry, forage legumes, and grain legumes, because they, of course, can fix nitrogen from the air into a form that can feed people and improve the soil. But when we take them out onto farmers' fields, it can be a disaster. This was 
uh, actually with the DG of Simic, Jim Ryan in those days, <laughs> participatory work in the field with groups of farmers testing out these soil improving technologies. We can see that this crotillaria green manure, which works beautifully on the research station, was completely failing. And there's a lot of sociology behind this, because of course the farmers were being quite selective in the plots they were giving us. We said that we could improve their soils, so they gave us their worst soils. It's quite logical really, isn't it? But this basically shows us then that there are no silver bullets. That our technologies, when they're taken out of their comfort zone, often don't perform in the way that they may be should. What's this got to do with conservation agriculture? Well, in 2008, I got an invitation to a workshop in Rome. It was being organized by three people. Some of you might know their names. Amir Kassam, Theodor Friedrich, Francis Shaxon. It was all about an investment in soil health. And the primary goal was to get the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to invest in soil health. But when I read the documents, it was purely about conservation agriculture. Now, for those of you who aren't agronomists, a slight diversion. So the principles of conservation agriculture, as it's defined by FAO, are threefold. <coughs> minimum or no mechanical soil disturbance. So not using tillage. The second one's keeping a permanent soil organic cover, organic soil cover and mulch. And ideally, it should be at least 30% soil cover. And the third one is then diversified rotations with legumes. Yeah? So I couldn't object to that at all, of course. Legumes. But I didn't understand why this focus on tillage? Why this focus on soil cover in systems where I didn't feel that it could work? But when I read the details of the invitation, and I read this thing, I, I hope you at the back can see it, but basically it says, constraints to adoption, and it talks about the mindset of the plough, and it the ploughs become the symbol of agriculture, and many, including farmers, extension agents, researchers, and university professors <laughs> and politicians, they have difficulty in accepting that agriculture is possible without tillage. And at this point, I thought, my blood started to boil. You know? I sent an email to the organizers saying, terribly sorry, I've got my holidays planned, I can't attend, but I'm concerned that you're equating soil health with just with conservation tillage, nothing else. They sent my email to all of the other invitees to the meeting, and a huge email discussion burst out, which I'll come back to later. Now, I was so angry about this that I wrote a paper, and I called it The Heretic's View. <laughs> And I wrote it in about three weeks, and we submitted it to a journal, because I was also very frustrated that all of the information we were getting was in grey literature reports from here and there. There was nothing in the peer-reviewed literature. Maybe I'm naive, but I still believe, to some extent, in the peer-review process. Our arguments were that conservation agriculture was being promoted as a panacea. There was this rather unholy alliance of international organizations, FAO, NGOs, and many churches, which were actually stifling debate. We weren't allowed to discuss this issue. The plow is the enemy of sustainability. Quote. I'll come back to the other issues around farming God's way later. The, we had two arguments in this paper. It's a very simple paper. The scientific evidence to support claims for made for CA, they were inconsistent, basically, it was unclear, and that CA really didn't fit to the majority of systems in Africa. <coughs> this is one of the emails I got from John Landis in Brazil. The biggest problem of adoption of CA is this decompaction zone. <laughs> And there's a link there to a, a, a blog, which basically are all our email correspondence was put on the internet by Peter Hobbs, who's in the room somewhere, and is available as, as a teaching material. But this was really going very far. We had creationist churches involved, care of creation, a creationist church. They're raising lots and lots of money in the United States, using it to promote farming God's way, <coughs> proven technologies that give dramatic increases in yield. We had scientists lining up in declarations 
a thousand delegates with the new Delhi Declaration on Conservation Agriculture. <coughs> Comesa, legislators endorse conservation agriculture. Comesa promotes conservation farming. Kenya designs an investment framework for conservation agriculture. We calculated about $50 million were being used to promote conservation agriculture at that time, 2008-2009. FAO came up with this new paradigm for agriculture, save and grow, a policymaker's guide. Right? Policymaker's guide. Farming systems part of that, and I like to think of myself as a farming systems agronomist, yeah? not just thinking about crops, but farming systems. It was just about conservation tillage, nothing more. Yeah? All farming systems was condensed again into conservation tillage by FAO. And this sentence I highlighted here, trials saw a six-fold increase in maize yields. Now this is for policy makers. I couldn't understand this, so I wrote to Theodor Friedrich at FAO and said, please can you share the data with me which backs up this statement? He didn't respond. So I wrote to his boss, Shivaji Pandi. Shivaji Pandi passed the email to Theodor Friedrich. We had another very long email correspondence. The closest he came to providing any information was this. The text clearly says trials, so a six-fold increase. It does not claim a six-fold increase in general. I think this is totally misleading. Theodor refused, basically, to respond. Now, going back to that slide I showed you before, I actually showed you a slide with a very poor soil, but close to the house there was some good maize. Now we see that pattern very often. Here we are in western Kenya. We have a farmer with a lot of resources of manure, good yields all the way down. Here we've got a resource poor farm. We've got a little bit of manure, applies it close to the household, the fields going further away are more depleted. Now we ran a whole series of trials, and I have to show you some data because I'm an agronomist. We had a series of trials, 32 different fields across what farmers classified as their good, their medium, or their poor fields. Now this is data over four years cumulated. So they weren't getting yields of 16 tons, that's the yield of four seasons. What it showed that with or without tillage, with or without mulch, there was no difference on the best fields. The best fields were in good condition, they didn't really need that. But of course CA can be very useful because it's controlling erosion. On the medium fields, we saw a glimmer. Yeah, it was just about significant <coughs> that without tillage and with mulch, things were getting better. But again, on the poor fields, the fields where things like our legumes don't work, this is the result we got. With tillage, much better yields than without tillage. Why is that? Well, if you don't have mulch and you don't till the soil, you get capping, you get runoff, you get erosion. It's the worst thing you can do to a soil is not kill it if you don't have mulch. And of course, in those fields, they weren't productive, so they didn't produce any mulch, so there's no mulch to go in the soil, so you're on a degradation spiral. And when we look around in that area, on the same day as we were looking into these experiments, what are farmers doing with their residues? Well, they're tying them into trucks, and they're selling them to dairy farms. So they have an economic benefit, which is way beyond putting them back in the field. Now, at the same time then, there was a, an advisory consultancy for the Gates Foundation, which came up with this <laughs> slide, it's not mine. They did share their, their, their report with me, it's a slide. And it came up with this Gillers gauntlet. Perhaps the simplest conclusion is that under present circumstances, conservation agriculture is inappropriate for the vast majority of resource-constrained smallholders the smallholder farmers and farming systems. In that was my statement. What's happening now? This came out just before Christmas from <laughs> Howard Buffett. Howard Buffett Foundation is a great supporter of conservation agriculture. Howard Buffett's goal is to see conservation agriculture adopted across Africa. You can listen to the academics or you can listen to the farmers. So let's just zoom in. What's the quote? The quotes from Ken Giller, conservation agriculture does not fit within the majority of smallholder farming systems in Africa. I had to really search for this quote, and it was actually in a PowerPoint presentation I'd given somewhere, which I think was a very nuanced and balanced presentation. Anyway. 
And there's also a quote from Nature from Cameron Pittlecoat, and he puts this up against farmers. And of course, farmers know best. So here we've got a farmer, before I only had 0.3 hectares, now I'm farming an additional 0.8 hectares. The land I have is beautiful, soft, and fertile. <coughs> it's a farmer's statement. I don't deny that. What's our experience? This is a slide that Jens took in Zimbabwe, just next to the road. The lady said to Jens, and this is, it might seem strange if I tell you that this is all about minimum tillage and, and things. It might seem strange that this is seen as conservation agriculture in the first place, but this is called conservation farming and promoted by the FAO, digging little pits. Jens turned up, the first thing the lady said, oh, have you brought me fertilizer? There was a promotion program going on as part of this protracted relief program, which basically was giving farmers fertilizer if they had 0.25 hectares of pits dug. If you didn't have the pits, you didn't get the fertilizer. When we walk further onto the farm, beyond the 0.25 hectare, the farmers are using a plow. Yeah? Why? You ask them. Well, it's easier. We only do this because we get the fertilizer. We have evidence for adoption in Madagascar here. Almost exponentially, it's really taking off. Until we look at what's happening, well, actually, the number of years under CA goes down dramatically. Some farmers are holding it for two years. Most of them are actually abandoning it after one year. So the number's going up exponentially because the, the promotion's expanding and expanding and expanding, but the individual farmers are actually giving up straight away. This is hot off the press from last week, actually. This is uh, research you can do on your kitchen table, recommend it to you, using Google Earth. <coughs> so students are going to be out in Malawi soon looking at adoption of conservation agriculture. This is stuff he did comparing 2013 to 2014. Now watch this spot, it says 1314. That's a conservation agriculture plot we can see on Google Earth because those are the residues showing up. That plot remains, yeah? But if we look at the other ones, the other ones, you'll see the other ones, if I just flick to and fro, some are there in 13, but they've gone in 14, some in 14, they've gone in 13. So the idea that farmers need to keep this going for several years, well, farmers are obviously doing it, but they're moving it around all the time. We find actually very interesting patterns, nearly all the plots along the roads. Why? Well, of course, that's where the business is. <laughs> So does this thought for contestation of CA only apply to, develop, to de less developed countries? Is it something to do with developing countries? Well, the answer is no. John Kierkegaard from Australia, actually a bit inspired by our heretics paper, wrote this paper, Sense of Nonsense in Conservation Agriculture. Why the biggest problem in agriculture now in Australia is herbicide-resistant weeds. Why? Because conservation agriculture relies on heavy uses of, of herbicides, glyphosate. There's resistance developing. What's the easiest way to get rid of it? Tillage, actually. So tillage occasionally, combined with herbicides, can be a very good way of managing weeds. And we developed that in a paper we published just before Christmas. So is this a gold age for agronomy? Yes. Contestation around conservation agriculture, well, I just say, and the beat goes on. It doesn't seem to be stopping. The future challenges, a couple of slides now about what I call agronomy in context. Now, when we do experiments, and this is an experiment on farmer's land in Western Kenya over many seasons, we can show these very, very clear principles in agronomy. Yeah? Soybean on a pea-fixing soil with no phosphorus or inoculum grows very poorly, with phosphorus inoculum, grows very well. It's a truth, yeah? It's a fact. When we take this out, and this is a Gates project that I lead, we take it out and here we've got about 300 different, what we call farmer tryouts, farmers testing things. So here we've got a control yield. Here we've got the yield with the treatment. Anything above the line is a good response. Now there's a mean response to inoculum and phosphorus there of around a ton a hectare. But the variability is huge, yeah? We can express that as probabilities, where you can see that if some people are just using phosphorus, well, you know, in 30 odd percent of cases it doesn't work, in others it does. 
And I'd argue very much that our role as agronomists is to take our knowledge, but to look at what's going on in the real world, try and marry the two, and then of course try and explain these things. I don't have time, but I can explain a lot behind why we get this yield variability. Is that something that relates only to the developing world? Mm. Now this was something that made me, last year, just sit back and go, huh? This is a farmer in the Netherlands who's a real high-tech farmer. He uses every sensor possible. All the different companies go to him when they have a new sensor to test them out because he's got the best systems. They're sensor mounted, he has uh, adjusted planting across his field to his fertility, he uses real precision agriculture. And he farms around 500 hectares on 120 fields. Yeah? Definition of a farmer, well this guy farms on everybody else's land, but it's one farmer operation. Yeah? This is how things work these days. He has yields ranging from 20 to 90 tons across the fields that he's working on. Yeah? Now again, I can go into some explanation of why this is. But I think what is phenomenal is that a farmer who's doing the most high-tech thing in the world is also getting these amazing yield gaps, yeah? this huge variability. This isn't just something because farmers in Africa are stupid or something. I mean, we know that a lot of the reason that farmers in Africa don't get the high yields is because of all sorts of other resource constraints, etc. But it even happens in high-tech situations. Now, I would like to go on and talk much more about smallholder farmers, but Bart's going to do that later on, so I, I, I leave that very much for you. A golden age for agronomy? Well, I'd simply say, well, yeah, agronomy's in the spotlight. I think the onus is on us as a community, though, to engage in these debates around agronomy and to come back with a good understanding, if you like, of what's working where and for whom and why, that we can really communicate back to policymakers on the one hand and, of course, to the farmers on the other. And I just I finish things saying, saying then, well, are we ready for the great leap forward? As a, as a community, to be able to develop, deliver on all these different challenges that face us. Thank you very much. Good.